Benedict Beckelt, a native of Sweden, and now resident of the United States. Um, he holds a PhD in philosophy and classical philology from the University of Heidelberg, Germany. Uh, you guys must know, Nietzsche was a philologist as well. He, not a philosopher by profession, he, he did not study philosophy, but he wanted to uh, change. He actually wanted to teach philosophy, but he couldn't get the position. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, Benedict actually is both. So that's, we are lucky to have him here. Uh, he specializes, among other areas, in aesthetics, political philosophy, philosophy of religion and of history, and sociocultural history. Uh, he has taught philosophy and classical philology in Germany and France, and uh, worked as an educator and researcher here in Italy and Namibia. Uh, published books and articles, on philosophical and sociocultural issues, uh, especially on aesthetics. So I have two books coming up, uh, a memoir of his time as a volunteer teacher in the Kalahari Desert, and the other one relates to uh, the topic tonight, Oikophobia, Hatred of Home, in the Decline of Civilizations. So basically I work with political philosophy and philosopher of history. So it should be published soon, I assume, right? In the, this year, next year? Uh, hopefully this year, just entered peer review a couple of days ago, so. Uh, nice, nice, congratulations. Well, let's welcome uh, Benedict, thank you. And let's see what the autophobia is. <laughs> so, thank you, Yunus. Um, <coughs> the, um, Indeed, when it comes to the Nietzsche circle, um, what I had heard <clears throat> about the Nietzsche circle when I first found out about it was that it is not interested in hagiography of Nietzsche, it is not interested in simply glorifying, deifying Nietzsche, uh, but rather in understanding him and in applying him and uh, even going beyond in criticizing um, to some extent, uh, which is um, very much uh, conducive to, uh, to my purposes as well. Um, and, um, and so that's uh, what I want to talk about tonight is very much related to Nietzsche, but indeed it will go beyond Nietzsche and apply uh, some of the things he said to, um, to uh, problems that he perhaps did not discuss directly, but that he certainly hints at uh, and see what we can make of it uh, with his help. Um, and, um, and, and I think that's also in the, very much in the spirit of Nietzsche himself, who was not interested in doxography, simply uh, trying to find out what other philosophers have already said, he was interested in philosophizing, uh, and not in doxographizing, and in that vein, uh, I think uh, that's, that's something what I'll try to do tonight. Um, doxography has become sort of the, uh, the raison d'etre of a lot of philosophy departments around the world, unfortunately, and um, uh, philosophizing has become almost prohibited, and the Nietzsche circle does not fall within uh, that, um, uh, does not have that vice, I think, as, uh, as far as I have seen. Um, I should also issue a quick caveat, uh, namely that uh, I am not a Nietzsche scholar. Um, I have read everything Nietzsche wrote. I am an amateur in, in I guess, both senses of the word of Nietzsche. Um, but my own concentration, well, within, as Yunus mentioned, are elsewhere in philosophy. But um, so I know there, at least Yunus, uh, maybe others as well in this room know Nietzsche better than I do. Uh, so maybe I will have learned something myself by the end of the evening. Um, an opportunity I would certainly welcome, um, but, um, but being someone who loves Nietzsche very much, I uh, still think that combined with um, my uh, areas that I do work with, uh, there is um, something interesting that can be made from it. Um, I will also take, and this is also as a final preliminary point, I take a sort of bird's eye view of the things, we're going to, uh, of the things I'm going to discuss tonight. That is to say, um, I will not enter so much because the topic of orcophobia, as you'll find out, is a very broad topic. So I'm not going to enter that much into nitty gritty detail of various things, but take a, a rather distanced, large view of the various themes that factor into it. Um, and that's usually Nietzsche, how Nietzsche himself uh, writes, at least very much in his early work, which is what I'll be focusing on tonight. Um, Nietzsche um, can explain all of Western civilization in two sentences, you know, that's sort of his style. Uh, and uh, it does it sort of tongue in cheek, but, but that's certainly a bird's eye view uh, of the matter. So, um, straight into uh, in medias res, as we say, among philologists. 
Uh, oikophobia, what is oikophobia? Uh, I venture to guess that some of you, before you heard of this talk, had not heard of the term oikophobia. Um, oikophobia, the simplest um, definition of it is that it is the opposite extreme of xenophobia. So just as xenophobia is the hatred or fear of foreigners or strangers, xenos, uh, oikophobia is the hatred or fear of oikos, one's own home, oikos meaning home uh, or house in Greek. Um, it is when people uh, dislike their own civilization. Um, oikos is a multifaceted term. It can mean abode, um, house, home, um, uh, estate, inheritance, essentially anything really one's own. Uh, and so an oikophobe is someone who um, does not have anything against foreigners, uh, but who dislikes his own civilization. Um, the term has actually existed in psychiatric literature for some time in the sense of a literal fear of household goods, apparently there is such a thing, um, but the um, socio-philosophical um, use of the term orcophobia is quite new, actually. Um, it was used, it was coined in that sense by the British philosopher Roger Scruton as recently as 2004 um, in his book England and the Need for Nations, uh, and I will read a quick quote from that book, which will give you, uh, I think, a good idea of what he means by it, and this is the sense in which I'll use the term orcophobia myself. Uh, he writes there, um, orcophobia is, quote, the felt need to denigrate the customs, culture, and institutions that are identifiably ours, end quote. And then he continues uh, referring to the orcophobes as oiks, um, which I guess is also a joke because oik, right, is a British slang term for a dim-witted or, or annoying person. Um, writes, quote, oikophobia is a stage through which the adolescent mind normally passes. But it is a stage in which some people, intellectuals especially, tend to become arrested. The oik repudiates national loyalties and defines his goals and ideals against the nation, defining his political vision in terms of universal values that have been purified of all reference to the particular attachments of a real historical community. The oik is, in his own eyes, a defender of enlightened universalism against local chauvinism. And it is the rise of the oik that has led to the growing crisis of legitimacy in the nation states of Europe. For we are seeing a massive expansion of the legislative burden on the people of Europe and a relentless assault on the loyalties that would enable them voluntarily to bear it. The explosive effect of this has already been felt in Holland and France. It will be felt soon everywhere and the result may not be what the oiks expect." End quote. So uh, Roger Scruton is concerned mainly with Britain and Europe, to some extent that's sort of his bailiwick, uh, which is not so much what um, I'll be talking about today. Um, but, um, the, but so orcophobia is this sort of general tendency uh, to automatically ascribe anything that is wrong with the world to one's own civilization. Now, of course, I should point out that um, critique in and of itself of one's own civilization or one's own government is not uh, orcophobic. Mm -hmm. um, it is perfectly legitimate to criticize one's own civilization, to criticize uh, one's own government. Um, that is not phobic. Rather, um, what we are talking about is this sort of, uh, I'm sure everyone is familiar with the phenomenon, this sort of knee-jerk reaction where an American will automatically assume that anything that is wrong with the world is America's fault, or a Westerner will automatically think that anything that's wrong with the world is, is, is the West's fault without regard for evidence. It could be the case in a particular situation, but when it is simply assumed that it's the case um, and that it sort of exists as a kind of prejudice where people just sort of think that, yes, of course, other civilizations are innocent and it's somehow our fault. So that's the extreme opposite of xenophobia, uh, where one simply assumes that, like a xenophobe will assume that everything that's wrong in America is the fault of foreigners. Um, uh, the orcophobe will assume that everything that's wrong is the fault of, of us ourselves. Um, so those are the two extremes. Um, okay, so, um, I should, so I should also point out, by the way, though, because orcophobia often happens in a more subtle way than one thinks, because um, whereas I think it's easy to agree that it is not orcophobic in and of itself to criticize one's own civilization, oftentimes people who agree with that will call someone xenophobic the, mo the moment he criticizes another civilization. And if that's the case, then that itself is a sign of orcophobia, right? If you think it's legitimate to criticize your own, but not another civilization, that in itself, I think, is a subtle expression of orcophobia and sometimes concomitant allophilia, love of the other. Um, but, but that's just as an aside. Um, so, uh, Nietzsche, where does he enter into the picture? Um, 
I'm going to, as, as Jonas mentioned, um, I'm, uh, I'm a philologist for my sins as well as a philosopher, so I will be dealing with a lot of Nietzsche's early work, where, where he was still a professor in Basel and worked as a philologist. Uh, and in his uh, work, and the title of the talk was um, Nietzsche and the Disadvantage of History. So the Disadvantage of History uh, is uh, from, of course, his, uh, the title of his book, um, Vom Nutzen und Nachteil der Historie für das Leben, on the use, usually translated as on the use and abuse of history for life, though it actually means on the use and disadvantage uh, of history for life, um, which is the second essay of his um, Unzeitgemesse Betrachtung in the Untimely Meditations. Um, and so the disadvantage of history, um, it will become clear, I'm going to let Nietzsche speak uh, for himself and read a few quotes as well. Uh, but the disadvantage of history, um, briefly put is essentially when a people becomes so um, weighed down by a knowledge of its own past, by a knowledge of past crimes that one's own civilization has committed, that action becomes stunted, that the civilization is no longer able to project outward, out, outward force. Um, you could have somebody like, um, to stay in, in the classical philology world, somebody like Achilles in, uh, in, uh, in the Iliad. Achilles is naive, right? He doesn't He's not worried about committing, about making mistakes. He's not worried about his past. He just goes, he lives in the moment and he seeks uh, glory and loot um, and success. He is somebody who's typically um, not um, suffering from the disadvantage of history. Whereas someone who suffers from the disadvantage of history is someone who thinks, well, maybe, you know, last time we tried this, it didn't work out so well. Maybe we should do something different this time. That's someone who suffers from the disadvantage of history. Um, uh, a knowledge that comes to um, uh, act as a restraint on active, decisive action. Um, but I will read a quote from Nietzsche, actually two quotes from Nietzsche. Uh, the first one is from the foreword of, the, of this essay on the use and disadvantage of history for life, which is from 1874. He, uh, Nietzsche writes, uh, quote, we need it, that is to say history, uh, for the sake of life and action, not so as to turn comfortably away from life and action, but we want to serve history only to the extent that history serves life. For it is possible to value the study of history to such a degree that life becomes stunted and degenerate. And uh, the, uh, another second quote from section one, this is the Hollingdale translation, by the way. Um, uh, there he writes a somewhat longer quote, uh, the animal lives unhistorically, for it is contained in the present, like a number without any awkward fraction left over. It does not know how to dissimulate, it conceals nothing, and at every moment appears wholly as what it is. It can therefore never be anything but honest. Man, on the other hand, braces himself against the great and ever greater pressure of what is past. Forgetting is essential to action of any kind. There is a degree of sleeplessness, of rumination, of the historical sense which is harmful and ultimately fatal to the living thing, whether this living thing be a man or a people or a culture. He can no longer extricate himself from the delicate net of his judiciousness and truth for a simple act of will and desire. Only by thinking, reflecting, comparing, distinguishing, drawing conclusions, only through the power of employing the past for the purposes of life and of again introducing into history that which has been done and is gone, did man become man. But with an excess of history, man again ceases to exist." End quote. Okay, so that was a pretty long passage, but what Nietzsche, to basically um, bring it to a point, Nietzsche um, emphasize, uh, basically establishes here two stages, right? So you have the early naive tribal man, I call him quote unquote tribal, uh, who somebody like, I mentioned Achilles, someone like Achilles who simply lives in the moment, he does what he thinks is right, and he doesn't bother really with, with justification or anything like that. Uh, then you have, um, at a later stage in civilization, tribal man becomes civilized man, uh, because he has a past, and he starts to, as Nietzsche says, uh, thinking, reflecting, comparing, distinguishing, drawing conclusions, all of that knowledge that he carries with him by, by dint of living at a later stage of his civilization uh, ends up um, uh, stymieing his, um, uh, his dis the decisiveness of his action. So he is civilized, but at the same time also paralyzed. 
um, is, is basically uh, the point that Nietzsche is getting at here. Um, so uh, this is a little bit, it's not something I want to focus on so much, but I think it's worth pointing out that this dichotomy is related, at least to some extent, to the dichotomy that Nietzsche is going to develop later on, especially in the genealogy of morals between master and slave uh, moralities. Um, maybe not so much the slave morality, but certainly the master. Achilles is sort of uh, an example of the master morality in a certain sense. Um, the, uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with, um, with what, what Nietzsche means with the master, but the master and he also criticizes the master, by the way. He's not just saying that one side is completely good and the other side is completely bad. Um, but the master is essentially someone who simply takes his own superiority, his own power for granted. Uh, he's someone who doesn't um, uh, worry so much about what the lower classes or what other civilizations um, uh, think about anything. Uh, he simply does uh, what he wants, does what he thinks is right. That is the master, that is Achilles. And that would be early tribal man in this in, in this civilizational development, um, and um, whereas the uh, well the slave is actually not so important in this context, but the slave because the slave defines himself as against the master. That's not so much what we're talking about. But the master ceases to be a master because the master starts to be concerned later on in civilization with his own past, with whether a particular action is right or wrong in a more larger moral sense, and that is not something that the master really worries about. Um, and so the, the leaving behind of the master state or of the tribal state um, happens when a civilization matures and to use a metaphor that I think is maybe a bit of a cliche but I think it's useful, when a civilization starts to look at itself in the mirror and it sort of recognizes itself in a larger context. Um, that's when man becomes civilized and paralyzed, um, as, as Nietzsche would say anyway. Um, and. Um, the, it's the contact with the other, other sort of with a capital O, with foreign, with other civilizations that lead first to an excess of xenophobia because in the beginning civilizations class and it is simply assumed by one civilization that they're superior to another civilization. Later on, the contact with the other leads to the opposite, oikophobia, because for reasons which will become clear, um, but essentially it will lead to an excessive, an excess of self-critique um, instead of an excess of self-promotion, as had been the case in the earliest part uh, of that civilization. Um, so basically, to go somewhat beyond Nietzsche here, but certainly still very much based on what he says in various passages, uh, we can sort of paint out a, civili a typical civilizational trajectory, uh, especially as it applies to the Greeks, which was Nietzsche's one main concern in his early work, at least, but which can also be applied to other uh, civilizations as well. Sometimes when Nietzsche talks about these things, he talks specifically about the Greeks and he mentions Greek names. And sometimes he speaks in a much more general way, like civilizations will do this, they will do that. Um, so seeming to think that this goes not only for the Greeks but also for other civilizations. And uh, part of what I discuss in, in the book that Yunus mentioned in the introduction is in fact how it also applies to other civilizations. Um, but, but I'll focus on the Greeks. Um, so basically, the civilization begins as so I said, in a kind of a nomadic, uncultured, tribal way. Um, it clashes against other civilizations, scores successes against other civilizations, grows in territory and wealth and power, um, and uh, essentially grows so much in wealth and power that a leisure class is established. Uh, in the beginning, you have this sort of very authoritarian tribal state where you have the chieftain and the gods and the myths and everybody just sort of follows. Um, what, where the chieftain leads. Um, one success uh, has been massive enough, uh, a middle class is established and a leisure class is established, uh, and there is more room for culture to take root in the civilization. Um, uh, Nietzsche has a key term for this, which I'll mention in a moment. Well, actually, I'll mention it right now. It's logisierung. Um, it's the German word, kind of logicalization or logifying, something like this. Logicalization is a good term. Uh, how a civilization becomes more logical. Um, later on. So we will see, we'll come back to Logisierung, it's, it's an important term. Um, and so what happens when the civilization is advanced is that the natural uh, vanity and narcissism and drive towards self-promotion that every human being has, some more than others of course, but every <coughs> human being has some degree of this, uh, starts to become expressed toward one's neighbors, right? In the beginning when to take the Greeks, for example, when the Persians are about to invade and burn down your 
house and rape your wife and so on, one's sense of superiority will naturally be, the Greek sense of superiority will naturally be projected as against the Persians. We are better than the Persians. Uh, later on in the civilization, once the Persians have been defeated, and once the, once the threat that the Persians constitute is no longer perceived as existential, um, once there is wealth and power and you know, a safer and, and, and more pleasant existence, the natural um, drive towards self-promotion and superiority that every human being has in some measure or other will be more easily satisfied vis-a-vis -vis one's neighbors uh, than vis-a-vis -vis the foreigner, right? And so that's why what was originally xenophobia uh, through, the, uh, through the natural narcissism and vanity that people have um, becomes um, uh, converted mm -hmm. into oikophobia. Uh, this is a little bit uh, what Freud uh, famously called the narcissism of small differences, uh, the narcissismus der kleinen differenzen in the uh, civilization and its discontents, das Unbehagen in der Kultur. Um, he uses it in a, in a somewhat different context, but essentially uh, he says that he, he finds it interesting how he notices that people of similar societies, he actually uses people who are not exactly of the same society, like he'll compare Spaniards with Portuguese and North Germans with, with South Germans, um, at a time before Germany was, was a unified country, but, but it can be applied to people of the same society as well. You'll notice that people who are actually more similar will often dislike each other more than someone who, uh, th then they'll dislike people who are completely different, in a completely different civilization. Um, and the reason that happens is because the people who are of a completely different civilization are no longer perceived as much of a threat once the society has established itself and become more safer and more secure and you take out your aggression or your sense of superiority toward your neighbor, and that's where orcophobia uh, has a room, uh, gains room to, to sort of establish itself. Um, and, and this narcissism of small differences can of course be applied uh, or exhibited in, in any number of ways through the display of a particular virtue, through the uh, possession of the newest gadget, uh, or, or whatever it may be, but there's always some way to show that you are better than, than your neighbors. Um, and, <coughs> Charles mentioned maybe Plato in the Republic. Of course, this is a passage of which Nietzsche would have been very much aware. In Republic Book 8, uh, Plato talks to a considerable extent about how um, oligarchy uh, transforms itself into democracy, how uh, civilization tends to become more egalitarian uh, as it advances, which, uh, which for Plato is a bad thing. Plato is, is very anti-democratic, of course. Um, but it's essentially, and, and we see this excuse me, Nietzsche as well, <clears throat> that as the civilization advances, um, this sense of egalitarianism, and it's something I'll talk a little bit more um, in a short while, um, this sense of egalitarianism leads to um, more internal fragmentation because if everyone, when there's only one chieftain and everybody following him, um, the, the civilization is much more monolithic, right? Whereas if you have classes, which are established through success, uh, then uh, there is more room for diverse interest groups to establish themselves and to start competing against one another. And so egalitarianism plays a part <coughs> as well in the rise of orcophobia and the internal fragmentation and competition that will take place between different groups uh, of the same society. Um, this is an even more Roman than Greek idea actually because the, the Romans of course had a much longer history of empire uh, upon which to look back uh, than did the Greeks, people like Tacitus, the historian, and uh, um, even Livy, um, Cato the Elder, certainly the first significant prose writer of, of ancient Rome. Uh, they talk a lot about this idea of civilizational decline, partly through democratization, uh, but it, we, there's some of it in, in ancient Greece as well. Um, okay, so that's um, one of the main points. So uh, Nietzsche's um, logisierung, a term I mentioned a little while ago, logicalization of a society, that is essentially the idea that, as I've already intimated, as the society develops, um, in the beginning it's simply warlike and it uh, brutally crushes uh, opposing forces, but with the success there is culture, uh, there is science and philosophy, all these things come about. And Nietzsche does not normally would say, well, that's a good thing, isn't it? Um, well, Nietzsche would say not entirely because it does lead to this uh, disadvantage of history uh, that, um, that I mentioned earlier. And now at, in that vein, I'd like to read another quote uh, from Nietzsche, this one is from The Birth of Tragedy, which he actually wrote two years before the uh, Untimely Meditations, although this is actually, the first quote is actually from the attempt at a self-critique, which he wrote about a decade and a half later for the second edition. Uh, but the, uh, but the, the idea is pretty much the same as occurs in the main work. Um, 
which, and which pertains to this concept of Logisierung, that is, quote, what if it was clearly during the time of their dissolution and weakness that the Greeks became constantly more optimistic, more superficial, more hypocritical, with a lust for logic and rational understanding of the world, as well as more cheerful and more scientific? What's this? In spite of all modern ideas and the judgments of democratic taste, could the victory of optimism, the developing hegemony of reasonableness, practical and theoretical utilitarianism, as well as democracy itself, which occurs in the same period, perhaps be a symptom of failing power, approaching old age, physiological exhaustion, end quote. Um, so I think this point is fairly clear. The fact that the Greeks are becoming more rational, more reasonable, um, more scientific is actually a sign that they're growing weaker, okay? Um, and um, uh, the, um, and, and this, this, this idea of democratization is very important also for understanding ochophobia in general because ochophobia does not occur in authoritarian societies, right? Ochophobia only occurs in societies that have at least a measure of um, democracy or intellectual uh, freedom where people are, live in a space where they are free to question the customs and the traditions of their own society. Uh, and so uh, all these are prerequisites of ochophobia, and these things do not occur early on in a society. That is to, and that is sort of the internal contradiction of ochophobia because ochophobia can only happen if the society has been successful, if the society has risen past its tribal state and gained a measure of success, territory, wealth, science, culture, and so on, uh, and not in an authoritarian state. And so success ultimately leads to ochophobia, that is to say, Success is what makes people dislike. I mean, there are some intermediary steps, but success essentially is what leads people to dislike their own culture, where if, whereas if their own culture had not been successful, uh, its members had not started to dislike it. And so there is obviously some uh, a tension between that. You would think that the more successful, the more you love your own culture, but in fact the opposite uh, historically uh, is true. Um, okay, so... Um, and, and um, another point I would also make in this context is that ochophobia is, and now we're definitely going beyond Nietzsche because Nietzsche looks mainly at the Greeks, although, as I said, he, he sometimes speaks also generally of, uh, of civilizations in general. Ochophobia moves not only in a cyclical fashion, that is to say that ochophobia appears as a civilization starts to quote unquote decline as it advances in this way, um, but ochophobia also moves in a helical fashion, like a spiral. Um, at the risk of sounding a little too Hegelian, which is actually not my intention. Um, um, those of you who know Hegel, of course, knows that the helical movement is, is important for him in a somewhat different context, but anyway. Um, because since democratization and egalitarianism are requisites for ochophobia, it moves in a helical fashion because a lot of Western civilizations tend to become more democratic in their later stages but with each new civilization, these, the phase of um, the development of egalitarianism and democracy is even more advanced than it was in the previous civilization, right? So ancient Greece had democracy, which is why they gave us the first case of Western orcophobia. But their democracy was not as democratic as our democracy. Of course, they had slaves, women could not vote, etc. cetera. Uh, so that since we have even more democracy and even more egalitarianism than the ancient Greeks had, it stands to reason that our orcophobia will also become more extreme. So, as I will talk about in a little while, we definitely see clear examples of orcophobia in ancient Greece, but that phenomenon becomes even more extreme in later civilizational manifestations thereof, right? Uh, we can we look at um, Roman Empire, France, uh, Britain, uh, the United States. I'm not going to look in detail at all those civilizations uh, tonight. We don't have time for that, but essentially, <coughs> this is the reason why orcophobia moves in a helical uh, motion. It's cyclical, but, but more extreme every time. Um, okay, so um, the, I would also make the additional point uh, before I get to probably what the, the main final part of the sort of theoretical scaffolding uh, that, that I'm building up is that um, as the civilization advances, the man of thought and the man of action become separate. That's also a bit of a cliche, but it's a cliche for a good reason. Um, early on in the civilization, and you see this in, Greeks, in, in Greece as well. Early on in the civilization, the man of thought and the man of action are not separate, okay? They are the same, uh, to the extent that there is a man of thought at all. Achilles is not much of a man of thought. He 
is definitely much more of a man of action. But, and, and you see this in, in, in archaic Greece and even in classical Greece. Uh, Sophocles was a general, uh, Euripides was an athlete. Um, nowadays we have the prejudice, of course, that if you are, um, if you are a brilliant mind, if you have a brilliant mind, you're probably not you know, a great athlete or, or, uh, or, or very able-bodied. Uh, and if you are, we have also have the prejudice that if you're an athlete or a soldier, you're probably not the most brilliant of the brilliant. Uh, that is, of course, a completely modern prejudice. Uh, the, the ancient Greeks would not have understood that attitude. Um, but nonetheless, even in ancient Greece, we see as the civilization develops that the man of action and the man of thought start to be separate a little bit in late classical times, certainly in, in, in the Hellenistic uh, era as well after the conquests of Alexander the Great, um, where you have athletes and, and, uh, and soldiers and so on on the one hand, uh, and, and statesmen and, and philosophers. Uh, and scientists on the other hand. Um, and, and so the man of thought, um, this is sort of the general idea, the man of thought, uh, by having all of this theoretical knowledge, by having the disadvantage of history in his mind, uh, becomes more orthophobic, whereas the man of action, by having a much more direct relationship between his own success and the success of the civilization for which he is being active, is less uh, prone to orthophobia because because of the very action which he undertakes, he suffers therefore less from the disadvantage of history that too much knowledge uh, can cause. Um, and, and again, so that's another prerequisite for orcophobia and the separation between man of action and man of thought can only happen later on. It does not happen early on in civilizations. Um, finally, and this will lead me into the final point of the sort of theoretical scaffolding, is that science, as a, as a society becomes more scientific, science leads to a rejection of religion, right? Um, goes without saying, I think, that there is often a tension between science and religion, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on, on the juncture of history that we're talking about, but, <coughs> but quite clearly there's often um, a, a, um, a tension between science and religion. And um, the more scientific a society becomes, the more, therefore, it will question its own uh, religion, um, and this is why Nietzsche, and this he is sort of Nietzsche is under the influence of Ludwig Feuerbach here. Uh, we knew we know that Nietzsche read Feuerbach uh, as a teenager. Um, he writes about it in his letters, uh, and thinking especially about Feuerbach's book uh, *Das Wesen des Christentums*, *The Essence of Christianity*, uh, where Feuerbach um, sort of has this attitude that uh, the essence of Christianity, as as in the title, is the revelatory aspect. Of Christianity, right? Christianity is what he likes about Christianity. Feuerbach, that is, uh, is that Christianity uh, um, emphasizes revelation, right? Uh, you simply believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He came down. He died for our sins, and that's it. Um, and uh, Feuerbach criticizes scholastic uh, Christianity as it developed later, like Thomas Aquinas and, and so on, uh, for trying to explain everything through reason. He says, "Well, then, what's the point? The whole point of Christianity is that you simply believe, uh, or end of religion in general." Uh, and that once you um, sort of try to rationalize it, then you are already killing off what was the essence of your faith. And Nietzsche picks up on that point um, by, by equating essences with origins to some extent. This is sort of part of Nietzsche's genealogical method, genealogical method in general, which he will use, I think, quite effectively to criticize various things later on in, in his writing career. Uh, but Nietzsche follows Feuerbach in sort of considering the essence of um, of, uh, of a civilization to be its origin. Um, he um, considers everything Greek that is archaic to be sort of the essence of Greekdom. And once the Greeks start to question their own religion, he considers that to be sort of un-Greek. Um, and here I would like to read another quote from The Birth of Tragedy, section 23. From, uh, yeah, so quote, uh, without myth, that culture forfeits its healthy, creative, natural power. Only a horizon reorganized through myth completes the unity of an entire cultural movement. Alongside that, let's now place abstract people, those who are not led by myths. Let's imagine a culture which has no fixed and sacred primordial seat, but which is condemned to exhaust all possibilities and to live on a meager diet from all other cultures. That's already quite close to the territory of Okophobia. Um, and he continues, and there we have the present, the result of that Socratism whose aim is to destroy myth, 
what is revealed in the immense historical need of this dissatisfied modern culture, the gathering up of countless other cultures, the consuming desire to know, if not the loss of myth, the loss of the mythic homeland, of the mythic maternal womb, end quote. In the same vein, uh, I'll add, write another quote as well from the same book, uh, Birth of Tragedy, section 18. Quote, and now we must not conceal from ourselves what lies hidden in the womb of this Socratic culture, an optimism that thinks itself all-powerful. Well, people should not be surprised when the belief in earthly happiness for everyone, when faith in the possibility of such a universal knowledge culture gradually changes into the threatening demand for such an Alexandrian earthly happiness, into the invocation of a Euripidean deus ex machina. In the face of such threatening storms, who dares appeal with sure confidence to our pale and exhausted religions, which themselves in their foundations have degenerated into scholarly religions, so that myth, the essential precondition for all religions, is already everywhere paralyzed. Even in this area, that optimistic spirit, which we have just described as the germ of destruction of our society, has gained control." End quote. Okay, so I think the, um, the influence from Feuerbach here is clear. He prefers revelatory religion to, to scholastic uh, rationalized religion. And he thinks that once a people has rejected uh, its revelatory religion, where they genuinely and naively believe in their own myths, they become, uh, they become weakened. Um, and this leads to, the, to this final uh, theoretical point that I've been hinting at, and that is the decline of religion in, as civilization progresses, and how, decline, the, the, how the decline of religion is an essential component of orcophobia. Um, so there are two points to keep in mind uh, when it comes to the decline of religion uh, on this orcophobic trajectory of civilizations. Um, the first uh, point is that um, there is nothing like religion for a sense of membership in a community, okay? Um, that is to say, religion or, or a belief in God is that which creates a greater feeling of togetherness with, you, with your fellow uh, than does anything else, okay? And I'm, that's, I'm not trying to proselytize, I, I am an atheist myself, so I am not um, uh, saying that simply because I like religion, uh, which I don't particularly, um, but the evidence of history is clear. Okay, the evidence of history is absolutely clear uh, that religion is the strongest force of communal cohesion uh, in societies. And not that I like to appeal to authorities because again, the evidence of history speaks for itself, but uh, many philosophers of all different kinds of stripes, even though they may disagree with each other and many other things, all agree that there is no, uh, no force for communal cohesion like religion. I could mention um, Machiavelli, Hobbes, Hegel, Voltaire, uh, Nietzsche himself, uh, Durkheim, um, there are lots of all different kinds of philosophers who all recognize that, Schopenhauer as well, uh, who all recognize that same fact. Um, and in this uh, regard, I want to read another quick quote from Nietzsche. Um, this is actually from the Nachlass, um, as, which means it's my own translation uh, for the, uh, the, some of the notes that have come down to us that he wrote for the Griechische Staat, the Greek state, <coughs> Homer's Wettkampf, uh, Homer's uh, struggle. A couple of just quick notes. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, he writes, quote, The mythical prevents an individual's self-seeking. What means does the Greek will employ in order to limit the naked self-promotion in the struggle, that is Greek competitiveness, and to put it in the service of the whole? The mythical. End quote. And then also another quick note uh, from the, uh, another Nachlass piece, Wissenschaft und Weisheit im Kampf, the struggle between science and wisdom. Uh, section two, uh, which is from 1875, he writes, quote, uh, only where the ray of myth falls does the life of the Greeks shine. Elsewhere, it is dark, end quote. Okay, um, so um, the, the, um, the, uh, the message of, the, of these quotes, I think, is perfectly clear. Um, myth, a belief uh, in your own myth, in your own religion, this what drives people forward. It what makes people. Um, it would. It would. It is what uh, turn people. It is what turns people into a community, um, and and makes them more creative. Um, the second point I want to make about religion is so. The first point is um, religion is a great force of social cohesion. The second point is the beginning of civilizations is religious. Right. So the beginning. There is really no exception. 
uh, the beginnings uh, of all civilizations are shrouded, are shrouded uh, in some measure or other in religion. That means that the farther away a, a civilization moves from its own origins through success, through wealth, through new territory, through uh, more uh, demographic widespread, um, widespreadness, um, the more it moves away from its own religion. Um, so that the growth of the civilization, the movement of the civilization is directly tied to a rejection of its own religion. Um, and, um, and this is part of the logisierung that Nietzsche has been talking about, the logicalization of the civilization, uh, which will question religion, and therefore, because civilization and religion are so tightly wound up, will come to question the civilization as a whole. So when religion starts to be questioned through logisierung, the civilization itself, not just the religious part of it, starts to become questioned. Now, a particular individual, of course, can reject the religion of his civilization while still remaining uh, patriotic or for his civilization in general, like Aristotle, for example, is a good example of that. Aristotle knew that Greek religion, or he thought that Greek religion was, was total nonsense, um, but he was still a kind of a hardcore Greek, for lack of a better word. He certainly, uh, he was certainly a patriotic Greek. Uh, he believed in the superiority of the Greeks over other civilizations, but he knew that Greek religion, that's, you know, we don't have to take that seriously. So individuals can do that, but societies as a whole, uh, societies as a whole, when they reject their own religion, they also reject their civilization, including, and that's very important, including the non-religious aspects of their civilization also come to be rejected because the civilization and the religion are so tightly, uh, are so tightly um, bound up together. Um, okay, uh, that's so much for the theoretical uh, scaffolding, I think, of, uh, of orcophobia and the disadvantage of history. Um, I'd like then to spend a little bit of time on discussing more specifically how this applies to Greek civilization, sort of as a case study, since, since um, Nietzsche himself is especially concerned uh, with Greek civilization. So I want to mention uh, a couple of names. Um, in the, we, we recognize three phases here um, as, we look at th as we look at Greek civilization, and part of my contention is that these three phases will be recognized in other civilizations as well, even though Nietzsche doesn't say so, uh, doesn't say so specifically. Um, the first phase is the phase where the civilization says, of course, we're superior to other civilizations, goes without saying. Um, the second phase is, well, yes, we are superior to other civilizations, but we now have science and logic, and so in fact, we have studied other civilizations and ourselves, and we find that based on the evidence, we are in fact better than other civilizations. And then the third phase, and the last phase, is actually, it turns out, we were wrong all along. We are not superior to other civilizations. We might even be worse than they. Uh, those three phases essentially recognize themselves, um, come to the fore in Greek civilization, and as I would maintain in other civilizations as well. Um, it should be clear, of course, also, I think, that we are not talking about strict um, divisions between epochs here, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not a Marxist, so we're not talking about um, iron laws of history or anything like that. We're talking simply about tendencies that overlap with each other um, in a certain sense, but tendencies that societies develop in a certain direction. Um, and so, obviously, in the beginning of the civilization, uh, of Greek civilization now, we have somebody like Homer, epic literature, which simply assumes that Greek civilization is the best there is. It doesn't really consider any other possibility. Um, even the Trojans themselves are portrayed as if they were Greeks, basically. Um, there is nothing else worthy of consideration apart from that which is Greek. Uh, and to the extent that foreigners are mentioned, it's just sort of um, on the side. They're, they're, they're not really um, lent any credence. I, I wouldn't say that Homer is particularly uh, xenophobic, but he, because, simply because like the master, right, the, the consideration of the other uh, capital O isn't really something that's relevant even. Um, Theognis is another name I would mention, an ar early archaic Greek poet, and I mention him because he was very important to Nietzsche. Uh, Nietzsche, when he was still a student of philology, studied Theognis quite a bit and wrote about him. Uh, Theognis is an aristocrat, early uh, archaic Greek aristocrat, who, if you read his work, again, there is this sort of assumption, and this is indicative of the first phase of the civilization, that he, as a Greek and as an aristocrat, of course, he is superior, of course, I am superior to the lower classes, of course, I am superior to non-Greeks, goes without saying, no other possibility is even thinkable. Um, then, civilization grows, becomes more successful, 
we get into the second phase. Histori Greek historians, Herodotus, uh, lots of people travel around, discover other civilizations. Um, um, the Greeks become aware that they are not, that there aren't just the Greeks, They're, they are in the larger world context. Um, and the second um, phase presents itself where the Greeks still consider themselves the best, but again, the best based on evidence, Aristotle himself, <coughs> uh, and indeed Herodotus are good examples of this. Aristotle obviously is a, is a result of Logiziabo. He is a very logical man, scientific man. He's not someone who simply assumes that he's the best, but he looks at the Greeks and he looks at other civilization and says, yeah, yeah on, on, uh, on balance, indeed, we are better than other people. Um, and, uh, and that is the middle phase. So it is, not, it is more self-aware. The civilization has started to look at itself in the mirror, but it is not yet self-denigrating. Um, and then, uh, finally, we move into the third phase, where, um, where civilizations, and now the Greek civilization, uh, begins to uh, realize, or at least to believe, that indeed it is not superior to other civilizations. Um, and when that happens, uh, essentially, uh, and, and this, again, it overlaps. Socrates would be the first example of that. That's why Nietzsche hates Socrates. He, I shouldn't say he hates Socrates. He actually expresses himself positively about Socrates in certain contexts. Uh, but he, so maybe not so much the man, but certainly Socratism, as he said in the quote I mentioned, uh, he dislikes Socrates because he feels that at this point the, log the logizierung has gone so far that, um, that the Greeks have become un-Greek by turning against themselves. Um, and, um, and this goes again, this goes together with the rejection of religion. We see from a bunch of literature, I can mention Aristophanes, Aristophanes complains that, the comedian Aristophanes complains that uh, Greek gods have started to be replaced by Oriental gods. Isocrates, um, the, uh, the, uh, the speaker, or the uh, uh, orator and, and philosopher, Isocrates says the same thing. He says that Oriental gods have started to crowd out Greek gods and this is leading to social division. Uh, Plato in the Nomoi, the Laws, complains that there are too many atheists in Greek society. And so all of this plays into the third phase uh, that I have mentioned and which is why Nietzsche dislikes Socratism because at this point basically the, the Greeks have come to the point that not only are they full of science and logic and reason, they have taken these things so far that they are now starting to question their own legitimacy um, and, and turn against their own religion. Um, in this particular context, I would mention uh, another dichotomy as well, namely that, uh, to now make a big jump in time, uh, namely Schiller and his little book, Über naive und sentimentalische Dichtung, on naive and sentimental poetry, uh, where he sets up a dichotomy between naive and sentimental poetry, as in the title. Um, and if we take, now that's not something that Nietzsche mentions in, in, any, of this, um, in any of these texts, but I think it's a very relevant dichotomy in order to understand what is happening here in, in the development of civilization. Um, Schiller says that um, naive poetry is that, like Achilles that I mentioned at the beginning, is that which simply lives in the moment and doesn't have any power of self-reference. It simply has its own perspective regardless of any other perspective um, and does and, and, and looks at the world through one single lens, namely itself. Uh, Homer is a classic example um, and of, of naive poetry. Then he says there's sentimental poetry, which is more lyrical, which is when the poet realizes that he is part of a larger world where he places himself in a larger context. That is to say, he refers himself to the, again, capital O, other. And Schiller, I think, makes a mistake because he says that ancient poetry is all naive and modern poetry is all sentimental. I believe that the dichotomy is to be drawn differently. The fault line does not go between antiquity and modernity. The fault line goes within civilizations. Early civilization is, tends to be more naive in, in the sense of this Schiller and dichotomy, and late civilization tends to be more sentimental. Uh, Schiller, to his credit, he says that Euripides uh, was actually a sentimental poet, uh, but that he's an exception for antiquity. Um, I think that's wrong. Euripides definitely is sentimental, but um, again, the fault line is to be drawn within civilizations. Once you start to refer to yourself, uh, refer yourself to the other, that's when the logisierung sets in, and you start to become more self-questioning, naturally. And that development, the development of poetry in Greek civilization and in other civilizations, follows that Schiller, follows that dichotomy that Schiller sets up 
uh, in that book. Um, since uh, since uh, Nietzsche hates Euripides, uh, because uh, Nietzsche feels that Euripides is part of this Logisierung, uh, it's worthwhile to mention because, especially in The Birth of Tragedy, uh, Nietzsche spends uh, many pages criticizing Euripides. It is worth, I think, dwelling upon the extent to which Euripides questions the myths, questions Greek religion, uh, which again, as I've been saying, is a very important part of how civilizations fall. Uh, two plays, I think, are worth mentioning. Um, and this is a shame because I think this is the point at which, um, before I conclude the talk, I'm actually going to start talk a little bit about where I think Nietzsche goes wrong. Um, since I said in the beginning, in the Nietzsche circle, we're also we're not interested in hagiography. Um, Nietzsche, the poet, loses here, I think, to Nietzsche, the philosopher. Uh, Euripides is an amazing poet, but uh, Nietzsche doesn't appreciate him very much because he is part of the process of Logisierung uh, that the civilization goes through. Two plays, I think, are worth mentioning, the Iphigenia and Aulis, which probably is Euripides' last play, was performed posthumously, uh, where Iphigenia, if you know the story, you know that the Greeks are waiting uh, in Aulis for wind so that they can sail to Troy and make war on the Trojans and take back Helen. Uh, but Artemis, the goddess, requires a human sacrifice so that they will get wind in their sails. And as it so happens, the woman, the human who needs to be sacrificed is Agamemnon's daughter, Iphigenia. So Agamemnon has to struggle between his fatherly love for his daughter and his obligation to the Greek army. Now, Euripides, that's, that's the version, that's most of the versions of the myth that we have. Euripides changes that and says, actually, it turns out that Artemis did not want uh, a human sacrifice. That was just human misunderstanding. And that's why, uh, in the last moment, Iphigenia is replaced on the sacrificial altar by a ram. Uh, of course, like in Genesis, where, where Isaac is, is replaced, and it turns out it was just a test of Abraham's faith. Uh, similarly, that happens in this myth, in Euripides' version of the myth. So what Euripides does is he steps out of the myth and says that, wait a minute, why should we even worship gods that require human sacrifices? So he, he really turns the myth on its head, and this is part of the reason why Nietzsche doesn't like him, because he starts to question Greek religion. Uh, another great example, probably I think the best example, is the Heracles Minominos, the madness of Heracles, uh, which I think is one of the best plays ever written. Um, the, again, according to most versions of the myth, Heracles has to commit the, has to perform the famous 12 labors in order to expiate the miasma that he has put upon himself by killing his family in a fit of madness. And so if you do something so horrible as killing your own family, it makes sense that you would have to do something, that you would have to go through heavy labors in order to sort of um, redeem yourself. Again, Euripides changes the myth and says, actually, no, he first performs the 12 labors, which means he is the benefactor of Greece. Everybody should love him. And then the gods strike him with madness. That is to say, the gods are extremely unjust. Why would they do this to somebody who has done, who has served the Greek people so nobly? Um, and of course, this happens because Hera is jealous of, of Heracles because uh, he is the son of uh, her husband Zeus with another woman, but she can't avenge herself on Zeus since he's the king of gods, and so he goes after Heracles instead. She goes after Heracles instead. Nonetheless, the gods prove themselves very unjust uh, by doing this to the great man Heracles, and so again, uh, Euripides is stepping outside of the myth and questioning the very foundations of Greek religion. Um, one little quote here from, uh, um, one from, um, from Euripides as well. He says, quote, Heracles says, what man would utter prayers to such a goddess? Because of jealousy of another woman's bed to spite Zeus, she has destroyed the benefactor of Greece, though he was innocent of wrongdoing. And the chorus says, we see her in the hand of none other than Hera, wife of Zeus, you are quite right. And Theseus says, when you die and pass to Hades' realm, speaking out to Heracles, uh, the whole Athenian state will revere you with sacrifices and stone memorials. It will be a crown of honor to my people that they are famed among Greeks for helping a noble man. 
people who know what it's like to worship, to be in communion with God, and people who know what it is to engage in artistic expression, whether it is a painting or fashioning a sculpture, writing a poem, whatever it may be, know that these two experiences uh, definitely have something in common. They involve rapture. They involve transcendence in some way. Um, and so Nietzsche realizes, uh, or at least I should maybe say realize, but he makes the point that if you take away religious transcendence, if you take away the rapture, uh, that uh, religious uh, experience that communion with God can afford, then you also take away um, the creativity, uh, artistic creativity of that civilization, um, because they are really very similar. Um, that, that unconditional love upon which revelation is based, uh, that unconditional love is also the affirmative force that exists in an artist as he or she sets out uh, to create. Um, and, and again, so this is why the, uh, this is an additional reason why the fall of religion um, uh, involves the fall of the entire society and not just of the religious aspect uh, of the society. Um, so uh, to finish off the, the, um, the uh, Greek trajectory here, um, we could mention a couple of other names uh, in the third phase that I've been describing, the, the self-denigrating or the self-questioning phase, uh, basically contemporaries or um, or, uh, or successors in some respect of Socrates. Um, just a couple of names I'll mention. Antiphon the Sophist, who um, is a cosmopolitan, emphasizes the equality between Greeks and barbarians. Um, you realize, of course, I use the word barbarians because that's the word the Greeks used. Um, uh, and it's interesting to note, of course, that the idea of equality appears precisely in that civilization which could plausibly have laid, made some claim on being superior because, quite frankly, they had many things that neighboring civilizations, uh, for the most part, did not have. And that's the same, uh, that's not just true diachronically, but also synchronically. Uh, you see this um, today as well. If you go to indigenous uh, communities in Africa, uh, the societies there will usually take it for granted that some customs, generally their own customs, are better than other customs. Uh, where it is here in the West, uh, a more quote unquote advanced civilization, uh, that considers uh, Western civilization to be equal or maybe in some respects even inferior uh, to, uh, to indigenous civilizations or to other, to, to foreign civilizations. Um, and so that, that is the case in, in Greece as well. Uh, Hippias of Elis, uh, who is a cosmopolitan and who is extremely arrogant to those of his fellow Greeks who disagree with his enlightened views, uh, very much like a modern Oncophobe. Uh, Alcidamas, who is a pacifist, which is unusual for the ancient world, Pacifism, again, is also something, well, I shouldn't say again, I haven't mentioned it before, but pacifism cannot appear in early society, maybe in some particular individual, but certainly not on a mass level, uh, because um, the precarious state of the early society requires people to band it together. I have discussed um, the oikos, the, the blind following of the chieftain, uh, and when the Persians come knocking and have just burned down the Parthenon, you don't have a choice. You're not going to be a pacifist. Um, later on, the Persians have been eliminated or at least uh, pushed to the side. There is peace everywhere. Um, the society has gained an excess of strength so that when there is some conflict, uh, it is not necessary for the entire society to fight. The society has so much strength that it is possible for only a portion of able-bodied men to fight. And that's why pacifism gains room to exist. Um, so again, um, I'm not a Marxist, as I mentioned before, uh, but it's certainly true to some extent that morals will form themselves according to the socio-cultural uh, and socio-economic, to some extent, circumstances that happen to be the case at that time. Uh, and of course, the same could be said for the lack of pacifism uh, early on in the civilization. Um, so al Sadamas is a, is a pacifist. He also believes that God made everyone free, which is unusual for a Greek to say. Uh, and um, which again also suggests an equality between peoples. Uh, Antisthenes um, is a cosmopolitan as well. He believes that there is only one God, not several gods, and if there is only one God, it follows that there is only one humanity, with no people being superior to any other. And finally, Diogenes the Cynic, probably the founder of the Cynic School of Philosophy, who is, if we at least believe the words of another Diogenes, Diogenes Lurtius, who writes, uh, biographies of the famous philosophers says that um, uh, Diogenes the cynic is the one who invented the word cosmopolitanism. When people ask him where he is from, he says, cosmopolites, a me cosmopolites, I am a citizen of the world. Um, 
Okay, so with that, I finish off the Greek trajectory. Um, I come finally, I was actually, I had some notes here as well for the Roman trajectory, which I figured if I had enough time, but I'm actually um, been talking for quite a while already, so I think I'll probably leave the Roman trajectory out. Uh, but it was just to illustrate that the, the exact same kind of pattern uh, can be applied to Rome as well. Rome does not become quite as oncophobic. That is a bit of an exception in the helical movement that I talked about earlier. Rome does not become quite as oncophobic as ancient Greece because Rome, uh, the Greeks, again, we're talking now here, of course, in generalizing stereotypes, but the Greeks are essentially a little more freewheeling, um, um, artistic, if you will. Uh, whereas the Romans have a much uh, stronger ingrained sense of patriarchy and hierarchy, and so that acts as a bulwark against some of the most, most extreme excess, excesses of orcophobia. Uh, but the same kind of general trajectory of first to middle to last phase is perfectly visible and traceable in the Roman civilization as well. And again, this can be done also in the future with, um, with modern civilizations, but uh, I could probably leave that out for now. I will simply conclude with um, criticizing Nietzsche a little bit um, so there are a couple of things. Um, Nietzsche, um, I've already suggested some of these things before. Um, Nietzsche, in my opinion, uh, makes a mistake when he says about the Greeks that this process was unnatural. Uh, there is a, a bit in the Nachlass piece, uh, Wissenschaft und Weisheit im Kampf, that I mentioned before, the, sci uh, the struggle between science and uh, wisdom, where he says basically, rather naively, I think, that the Greeks were a very clever people uh, the fact that this happened to them, that this process of logizierung happened to them, is completely unnatural. Uh, it is, in fact, not unnatural. It is perfectly natural, and that can be seen in the fact. Uh, and again, this is Nietzsche kind of gives us some of the key terms, but he doesn't put this up as a, as a as a model of general civilizational development. And so he's still able to consider this to be unnatural. Whereas if you look at many case studies, many civilizations, you see that the process is in fact perfectly natural because this is always what happens. Um, that you see these three phases develop. Um, and um, uh, so, yeah, so he says that, the, the, uh, that this was unnatural for the Greeks. Um, he, because he considers it unnatural, he disregards the quality of some of the uh, cultural accomplishments of, of, of late civilizational um, art. Uh, and I think Euripides is, is, is a great example of that. Um, Aristotle could not have existed if logizierung had not taken place, which is to say that uh, the Greeks as a great people could not have, the Greeks as a great people as Nietzsche sees them could not have produced an Aristotle, who is a result of logizierung. Uh, and that's a little ironic because the great man, as perceived by Aristotle uh, in his Nicomachean Ethics especially, had quite a bit of influence on the great man as Nietzsche uh, perceives him later on. Um, and so, um, and Nietzsche himself, by the way, would have been impossible because Nietzsche hates Germany. Um, he, he's, that's actually an example of reactionary orcophobia, which is a whole kind of a different, um, different, um, different type of orcophobia. It's not when you, it's not when you start to consider your own civilization um, inferior. It's when you see what has happened to your own civilization and you love your civilization so much that you begin to hate everyone who is a part of your civilization because you feel that they are dragging it down. So that's a kind of a reactionary, kind of a conservative reactionary orthophobia. Uh, Plato is like that in ancient Greece. Uh, Juvenal is like that in ancient Rome. Uh, there, are, there are a bunch of different examples. Uh, Cato the Elder as well. Um, and, and so that is um, Nietzsche's belief that the Greeks were too, really should have been too smart for this kind of thing is kind of naive. We don't understand the Greeks if we think that the Greeks were archaic, were the Homeric Greeks, Achilles, and so on. Uh, we don't, if we follow Nietzsche, we fail to appreciate the fact that the Greeks were the first of all self-critical peoples, which is, a, which is a, an amazing um, accomplishment. This is part of much of the reason why we are still talking about the Greeks, because they were the first self-critical people. Uh, they were the first people, as I said before, that looked themselves in the mirror, and that is something that is kind of lacking from Nietzsche's appreciation. Uh, of the Greeks, um, and um, and then he, I think he doesn't appreciate that because it really goes against his master ethos that he will develop later on, as I mentioned um, in the genealogy of morals. Uh, 
Um, and so Socrates and, and uh, these other names that I mentioned and, and others, yet they are not so much the sort of conspiring uh, destroyers of Greece as they are part of the natural, again, emphasis on natural, process of self-destruction that the Greek civilization and civilizations in general go through. Um, there is indeed much we can learn from the archaic Greeks um, if we sort of rid ourselves of the academic prejudice that truth must be complicated, which uh, is certainly not the case. Um, but, um, but Greekdom does not end for the archaic Greeks. It continues, uh, which is why we're still talking about them. Um, and that pretty much uh, concludes things. I want to read a final quote from Nietzsche, uh, which I think puts a nice finishing touch on it. Again, this is from the uh, advantage, uh, sorry, from the Use and Disadvantage of History for Life, section three, where he writes, quote, Sometimes this clinging to one's own environment and companions, one's own toilsome customs, one's own bare mountainside, looks like obstinacy and ignorance. Yet it is a very salutary ignorance and one most calculated to further the interests of the community, a fact of which anyone must be aware who knows the dreadful consequences of the desire for expeditions and adventures, uh, especially when it seizes whole hordes of nations and who has seen from close up the condition a nation gets into when it has ceased to be faithful to its own origins and is given over to a restless cosmopolitan hunting after new and ever newer things." End quote. So the word orcophobia does not exist um, to Nietzsche. As I mentioned in the beginning, it is a neologism, um, a modern neologism. Um, and so that particular sphere uh, this, uh, which is uh, what also what I'm trying to promote with a book that Jonas mentioned, uh, that this is a particular sphere of political philosophy is not something that was clear to Nietzsche. Nonetheless, um, I believe in this quote that I just read, he is indeed describing orcophobia. And with that, I uh, conclude my talk. Thank you very much. Lots of ideas. As I say, a bird's eye view, certainly. <laughs> So, well, any, 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 I don't know how many of you are familiar with Nietzsche's works closely, but uh, any, any questions? Any? Here, uh, what, why do you think um, success is such a big part of what you uh, Well, it's, um, as I was trying to describe, um, success um, broadens a person's horizons. I, well, I mean, not necessarily in the <coughs> person, but certainly if we talk about societies, success broadens horizons because necessarily part of the success of civilizations is the increase of territory, uh, is, is the increase of wealth, is the increase of ideas because you come into contact with other civilizations necessarily and you learn from them, um, which is exactly what happens. The reason why ancient Greece, when we talk about early ancient Greece, it was actually the periphery of ancient Greece that became civilized first, what is today Western Turkey and Southern Italy, um, where, where Greeks had built um, colonies they became civilized, quote unquote civilized, because they were in touch with civilizations like the Lydians, the, the Babylonians, uh, sorry, the Persians rather, uh, the, uh, the Egyptians, um, and, and received ideas from them. And so while Athens on the mainland was still sort of a village like backwater, um, the, the states on the periphery, uh, the cities in, in Western Turkey, uh, in Ionia, uh, were flourishing uh, with culture and philosophy and wealth and so on. Um, and they are the first ones to become decadent in the Nietzschean sense before the mainland uh, did so. Uh, the process of logisierung starts over there, and so that success, uh, that contact with other people, um, you will be influenced by other civilizations when you come, when you, uh, when you meet them. Uh, their ideas will become your ideas, and that will lead to self-questioning. Without that success, you'll stay in your own oikos. As I mentioned earlier, you, you will not see what is beyond your village. Um, and so there's no reason to question anything that you have because you don't know anything else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> um, I was wondering about uh, the Hegel spiral. Yeah. Of work and the, the, like, the simplicity of the way you present it. Is that, um, because I've understood Nietzsche as a, when you say, a modern society specifically, yeah. and I haven't really seen a kind of cyclical way of thinking of history. Actually, I felt that to be quite alien from him. Uh, right. And, and I was just curious because I understand that you read a hell of a lot more Nietzsche than I have. So could you elaborate on that? Because that's also a theme that is running through 
have contemporary politics and discussions about history. I mean, there are a lot of critical theories in history, and they all carry the same kind of idea, like decline mm -hmm. and then the rise. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I see that a lot in like radical right yeah. ideas about what is going on. So would you like to elaborate on that? Yeah, no but, no, but you're right to make that point, because Nietzsche himself does not say that history is, is helical or anything like that. Um, I think I mentioned Hegel, which probably was a mistake. I was going to try to keep Hegel away from, from this evening. Uh, but um, the, the helical pattern is, is much more Hegelian than, than Nietzschean. Um, so yeah, no, Nietzsche does not talk about that. Um, what the, the one um, thing where you might be able to see some cyclicality, uh, helicality for sure not. Uh, as far as I know anyway, there is no indication anywhere in Nietzsche of that. In fact, pretty close to some of the passages that I write, uh, that I, that I uh, read from, Nietzsche makes fun of Hegel and, and uh, kind of makes fun of Hegel for thinking, as Nietzsche puts it, for thinking that all of history was a preparation for his professorship in Heidelberg in Berlin, right? Um, and and uh, so he thinks that's rubbish. Um, but cyclicality, to some extent, we can trace from Nietzsche in the extent, to the extent that he doesn't only talk about the Greeks, right? So he jumps back and forth, especially in The Birth of Tragedy, also to some extent in, in The Untimely Meditations, uh, and talks about how sometimes this is happening to Greeks and sometimes this happens to civilizations in general. He doesn't, make it that clear when he's talking about the one and when he's talking about the other. Um, but if we, if, we, um, if we look at the comments that he makes about civilizations in general, if it is the case that he, that he says this about civil that this happens to civilizations in general, <coughs> then I think implicitly we can deduce some kind of cyclicality uh, from Nietzsche uh, about that, because if it happens repeatedly, well then that's cyclical, right? Because otherwise he wouldn't say civilizations in general, he would just have said, well, the Greeks only. Um, so, to that extent, I could see cyclicality in, uh, uh, in Nietzsche. Uh, the, the point about the helical movement with increased democratization and so on, that's, that's not at all Nietzsche, that's what I say. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, would you say that the final stage of civilization could be identified with uh, what Nietzsche calls passive nihilism? Um, well, if you can answer that, and then I have a follow-up for you. Uh, okay, um, pro yeah, um, well, yes and no, because um, I do think that that is, could, be, could be related to uh, the decline of civilizations, not, but not to the decline of civilizations as I have portrayed it just now, okay. I think. Um, and, and Nietzsche's concept of nihilism kind of cuts both ways um, a little bit. I mean, it's, it's like this concept of decadence, right? Um, it cuts both ways. He himself is a decadent. Right, um, in which uh, you know I think he recognizes, um, but uh, but but is a decadent that recognizes that he's a decadent, um, and and that um, yeah I think is probably related to the nihilism. So uh, so yeah I, I would say yes, but uh, but not in the sense that I have described. Would you, would you say that a post stage, if you will, of ochophobia would be uh, like an active nihilism, where we're actually uh, trying. Self-consciously attempting to criticize our customs, our values, our attitudes, in order to, if you, to use that language, self-overcome, move to the next stage of yeah. civilization. Oh, for sure, absolutely, yeah. So, and and you can point at several societies right now, in which for the which that's the case, yeah. But isn't uh, that healthy though? W wouldn't you say that ochophobia would be a, a stage of health, right? Even though when we look at it. Um, as a progression from uh, active man 